Hey gang, we are on a famous street here, one of several famous streets. This is Royal Street. And here on your left is a famous townhome on Royal Street. It was owned by a famous family in the mid 1800s. It was built in 1850s by a famous architect who lived here with his wife and two daughters. And it's a museum now, you can go inside. Look at these amazing wrought iron doors and columns. This is painted palace green. Now if you go inside, which is closed now, it's a museum, you will find a delightfully furnished Victorian style home. And what's most interesting is it had accompaniments that almost all the homes here did not have. They had hot and cold running water. They had a bathroom and they had a toilet. I saw a picture of the toilet. It was like a bowl, a porcelain bowl with the blue. And I think it had a bidet, a little bidet there. Anyway, we're gonna go to the cemetery to talk about this family. In particular, this man's father, who was the famous architect here, who would meet a horrific fate with his wife on a ship off Georgia. Hey gang, we made it to New Orleans. It's Monday, February 13th. Just came from Baton Rouge. And we are at St. Louis Cemetery number three. And as you can see here, cities of the dead. Everything's above ground and it's basically almost all mausoleums. Now for New Orleans, if you go back a couple of years, I did Metairie, I did number one, St. Louis number one, and a whole bunch of episodes here. So we're gonna go in a little bit of a deeper dive instead of doing the usual stuff and tell you some stories. And actually it's James Gallier Sr. here today. We're going to visit his crypt at the end. And it's a fascinating story. There was a ship called the Evening Star Paddle Wheel Steamer. And he was on board with his wife and the evening star went down in a huge gale off the coast. So let's take the walk. Let's look at some interesting mausoleums on the way and crypts and vaults, whatever you want to call them. I guess these are really the correct term for these are not mausoleums. These are vaults and crypts. And it's in beautiful shape here. Considering, you know, the weather that you get here. All right, so what is the story? We're going to do some, some reading today. We're going to do some reading. But basically the date was September 29th. It was in 1866. And it was that, that paddle wheel steamer was sailing from New York, bound for here in New Orleans. And unfortunately, as I mentioned, on October 3rd, 1866, it was off the coast of Georgia where there was a severe gale. It was at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and she was about 180 miles east of Tybee Island when it hit. Four times the crew had to rebuild the bulkhead only to see the waves tear it away. The rudder of the ship was thrown out of gear and the sea made for a clean breach over the ship, over and over. 
The brave captain told the passengers that there was little hope left and urged them to be cool. After weathering the storm some 17 hours, she finally foundered at six in the morning. Six in the morning on the third. 270 souls were on that ship and only 17 people were known to have been saved. There were only about three or four lifeboats on board, of course, one of which the chief engineer, his name was Robert Finger, the purser, six of the crew and two passengers succeeded after capsizing several times and keeping it afloat until they were picked up by a Norwegian ship, the Norwegian Bark Fleetwing. They were transferred to the schooner Jay Waring, and a second boat had 16 people. Among them were the captain and the third mate. That boat was capsized 12 to 15 times, and the, the captain himself, he was lost four times, but he managed to get back on board. The only passenger that was saved was in the third mate's boat, only one passenger. It was a horrific scene. A, a horrific scene. You can only imagine these old paddle wheels, big ship, but just being tossed about like a cork. And then the captain tells you, he says, there's little hope. Can you imagine? What would you do? Look at some of these vaults. So I'm going to read to you some harrowing accounts of the disaster. The first is from the Evening Courier and Republic. It was on October 17, 1866. And it was actually a statement from the chief engineer that I mentioned, Robert Finger. He said, I've been chief engineer of the steamship Evening Star since she was launched. And during the gale at 5 a.m., the engine stopped working. All hands were bailing the ship. At about 6 a.m. is when the ship went down. Now, up until the time the engine stopped working at about 5 a.m. on October 3rd, no ship ever stood up to a better, tremendous hurricane and heavy sea. She behaved herself nobly. The engine hatchways had been broken by the seas. My assistant engineers and water tenders and firemen along with the coal passers, all stood to their post bravely. They all obeyed orders promptly and coolly. They all proved themselves efficient and worthy men. Captain Knapp and all the other officers of the steamer, as well as the crew, were untiring in their efforts to avert disaster, and the passengers nobly seconded in their exertions in such manner as they were requested. Even the ladies were bailing. We set to prepare the boats for launching, which was accordingly done after getting the boats ready. It was found utterly impossible to launch them over the sides of the ship on account of the high seas, sweeping the deck from stem to stern. There were six metallic lifeboats, all seaworthy, well supported with oars, cans of bread and breakers of water, just previous to the steamer sinking, the passengers crowded into the boats, which were steady on the deck, ready for launching. None of the officers of the ship were in the boats now, all of them remaining on the deck until she sunk beneath the waves. When the steamer sunk, the lifeboats were carried down with her, undoubtedly capsizing and throwing their occupants into the raging sea. I found myself among a mass of wreck matter, to a portion of which I clung to for two hours, and I succeeded in reaching one of the lifeboats, to which some 20 persons were clinging. The boat was capsized several times, both by heavy seas and by coming in contact with driftwood, until the number was reduced to 10, 10 who were finally saved. At one time, I was thrown out with the others by a heavy sea, and I did not succeed in reaching the boat again until six or seven hours later, floating in the meantime on a piece of driftwood. 
I myself have lost a brother by this disaster. And as for my own personal safety through such dangers, I give my thanks to Almighty God. Signed, Robert Finger, Chief Engineer, Steamship Evening Star. And then from the Rhinebeck Gazette, August 1893. At about dawn, the captain solemnly addressed the crew and the passengers. He told them that the ship must go down. Men and women rushed about the deck, tearing their clothes off and plunging into the seething sea. There were several lifeboats, but they could not be lowered in such waves. So the boats remained on deck and were loaded with people who waited for the evening star to sink. Captain wept and bade farewell to his companions. The crew maintained good discipline. In an hour, the ship gave a lurch and plunged down into the ocean. The crowded lifeboats were sucked under and the sea was full of men and women calling in vain for help. Scores of them were crushed into the shapeless masses by the driftwood that swirled around the wreck. The last person to leave the ship before she sank was an Italian prima donna who waited calmly until all hope was gone. And when she felt the first convulsion of the vessel as it prepared to go down, she raised her hands and moved her lips as if in prayer and plunged into the roaring waters, never to be seen again. We talk about James. Who was James Gallier Sr.? Well, James was born in Ravensdale, Ireland in 1798, born as James Gallagher, the son of Thaddeus, a builder who also trained James in the profession. As a young man, he was admitted to the School of Fine Arts in Dublin. Career really started to launch in England in 1822 with his brother. They worked for about 10 years in Huntington and London. In 1827, he designed the God Manchester Chinese Bridge and then worked on the redevelopment of the Grosner Estate in Mayfair along with commissions for college buildings, prisons, and factories. During two of these Years, he apparently worked for the famed Greek revival architect, William Wilkins. In 1823, he married Elizabeth Tyler, and their only surviving child was James Gallier Jr., who also became an architect. He arrived here in the U.S., in New York, but soon the American cities in the North were growing too crowded for many and in the 1810s, 20s, and 30s, many, including Gallier, they left. So he made his move in 1834, departing New York to here in New Orleans. According to one source, Gallier changed his last name at this time, probably to fit in better with the community here, the status. Sadly, his wife Elizabeth would die. She would die in July of 1844. She would only be in her mid-40s. So here we approach the final part of our walk. And we are at the we are at the crypt, right in front of the crypt of Gallier right here and it is massive and there is a inscription to the mon this monument is erected to the memory of James Gallier architect of New Orleans born at Ravensdale Ireland July 24th 1798 by his son as a tribute to his genius, integrity, and virtue. 
and Catherine Maria Robinson, born at Barrie, Massachusetts, the wife, and of course there it says, they were lost in the steamer Evening Star, which foundered on the voyage from New York to New Orleans, October 3rd, 1866. From what I understand, they're not actually here. This is just a memorial put up by their son, James. Looks like it's sadly falling apart. Marble. Yes, Elizabeth in 1844 passed away in her mid-40s and in June of 1850, he was in Charleston, South Carolina. He married Catherine Maria Robinson. And that was to be his final wife. She was 24 years his junior. She had children from a previous marriage. So here in New Orleans, as his career matured, he found his services were in high demand. He was very popular and he was doing really well. He expanded as the city's population expanded. And he is credited with many, many famous works here. Too lengthy a list for this episode. The ship actually cracked in half, and according to two witnesses, they saw him fall into the crack. James and Catherine would have 16 wonderful years together before they met their fate on the Evening Star.